So I went back to school and I told my man, he was like, well, my dad got DJ equipment, let's do it. So we started DJing and at the time I was five foot four. So they used to call me shrimp. So I was like, yo, I would be DJ shrimp. He was DJ mono. And together we were Envy Productions. We went to an all white school. He was Haitian and, and, and we would always say people envied us. So we were like, ah, right, we're gonna be called Envy Productions. Uh, and we would put out on the tape, Envy Productions, just Envy Productions. And that's how we would sell the tape. We weren't making no money and it wasn't looking good. So he was like, yo, yo, I'm gonna go kick it to the girls. You can, you can do this. So I just kept doing it. And every time I would pass the, the tapes off to the bootleggers and the Africans on Jamaica Avenue in, in Harlem, they would be like, oh, you got the new Envy, oh, Envy. And the name just stuck. You know, I, I don't want to sound, um, you know, show age or anything like that. And like kids today will never know, but kids today truly will never know that mixtape age and the hype of mixtape and physically having something, you know, in your hands and playing that. Like, I, how much you reminisce, you know, about because you you're still heavy in it, but it's different the way the music industry has evolved. Yeah, no, it's definitely different. I mean, now you could just stream a record and keep it moving. I mean, back then you had to like you when you heard somebody's tape came out, it was word of mouth, and you went to the local places. If you were in New York, you went to Jamaica Avenue, you went to Brooklyn, or if you were in Virginia, you went downtown Virginia. Like you went to where, we, where you went to go buy sneakers. Cause back then you really didn't go to the mall to get sneakers there, cause they were too expensive. You went to the areas where the hood usually where you can nickel and dime somebody. If a, if a pair of Jordans was a hundred dollars back then, you can go to uh, Jamaica Avenue with 80 and, and homie would give it to you for 80, you know what I mean? And that's what we did. When you went and got the beef patties, when you went and got all those stuff, that's where you would get your mixtapes. And that's what, how I grew up. That's how I heard new music. The radio wasn't playing new music. There was no streaming. So the only way you would hear new music is from mixtapes. Oh man, I miss, I miss that era for sure. Now your, your meteoric rise and everything that you were doing, man, and congratulations on all the success. But I want to go back to those early days yep. of, of working with Charlemagne and Angela Yee. Hall of Famers now, you guys are, but um, the chemistry, what was it like in those early stages and did you envision it lasting as long as it didn't being as fruitful right. as it had? Um, I didn't want to do mornings, I'll be honest with you. I, I just had left Miss Jones um, and I left Hot 97 with the power and I was doing afternoons and I was fine with afternoons. I didn't have a, a, a team, I didn't have any coworkers, it was just me and I liked that because you know my show is, is you know, if, if Jones is, Ms. Jones didn't want to come to work today, it affects the show. You know what I mean? If Jones was on vacation, it affects the show. So now I got my own show. I'm like, I'm good. Um, then they, you know, they wanted to do a morning show. Ed Lover was doing mornings at the time and they wanted to do something different. Um, and they came and asked what I do. And I was like, hell no, I ain't doing mornings again. I'm good in afternoons. Um, and then, you know, they said Cadillac Jack was like, I'll, I'll double your salary. He's the program director at the time. I'm like, it ain't worth it. Now, mind you, when I left Hot 97 to go to Power, they really got me. And the reason they got me was when I left hot, I did not want to leave hot. I just told hot I wanted to leave to get more money. But hot was like, we ain't got no money. See you later. So now when I went to power, they knew I left. They kind of gave me the, the worst deal ever. Like it was, I was making less than I made it hot. But I told myself, I was like, and, then, and I told my program director, I said, look, I'm going to take this deal. But next year, you're going to have to triple it because you never, you're never going to see anybody that can outwork me. And he was like, mm -hmm. all right. And then the breakfast club came. Then he said, we'll double your salary. I was like, I don't want to double it. There's like, we'll triple it. I said, all right, now we talk. And I was like, I'll do it. I said, but who are the co-hosts? And they said, Charlemagne the God. I'm like, he, that man got fired a couple times. I don't want to do it with Charlemagne. And he was, they was like, nah, we've been talking to him. He's good. And then it was like, well, what out? What, uh, well, what about somebody else, a female, Angela Yee? I'm like, nah. They were like, why not? And I'm like, she's on Sirius Satellite Radio, so she curses too much. And there's a difference between cursing and this. So I'm like, I don't want to do that either. And then we started talking, and they wanted it to be at first more on like the DJ Envy show, something in my name, like the Steve Harvey show or the Ricky Smiley show. And I'm like, nah. And they were like, why? I said, well, one, if it doesn't work, I need to be able to still maneuver back to me. Mm -hmm. If it's a, a collective and it doesn't work, it's not issuing on me, it's I can still move around. I said, and two, I feel like a collective show does better because every party has their own equal equity. You know what I mean? If we all 33, 33, 33, we all gonna ride the same. And they threw us in a room and we all started working it. And what I think made it work so well, as I tell everybody all the time, we were always somebody's side, right? And what I mean by that is I was Miss Jones' side. 
uh, Angela Yee was Cypher Sounds' side, and Charlemagne was Wendy Williams' side. So we were always used to sharing the spotlight. We were always the side. So we always let each other, you know, shine. It was never like a, oh, well, now nah, he's doing too much or she's talking too much. We never had that problem because we all had a background of letting somebody else shine, which made the show work. There was no animosity or jealousy at all. I mean, the, with so many years that have passed, there's so much success. I'm sure there's too many to count, but is there a favorite story or interview that comes to mind during this Breakfast Club run? I mean, I think the biggest one ever, which is, is a cultural phenomenon, which is Birdman. I mean, you watch movies now, you watch ESPN, or you finish or you done, or trivia, you know, you see all of that in movies. And that all came from, a, I think, a two minute interview. Like the interview was like only a, a minute and 56 seconds or something like that. But that's how big the Breakfast Club is. Like we create those moments. A lot of times people pull those moments. But if you look at the Breakfast Club's history, we create our own moments. If it's not with interviewing or it's with our own jocks, like we create our own content, which most people can't do. With all the success that you've had, going back to your beginnings, could you have accomplished any of this without Dia by your side? Ah, oh, hell no. <laughs> not, I mean, and, it, and, and not only was she my number one supporter and is my number one supporter, and she's the one where people don't believe in your dreams. She's the one that pushes you up and, and all that. But regardless of all that, because that's the stuff that everybody says. But I remember when I graduated out of college, right? I went to Hampton University and I graduated. And my parents were like, all right, you graduated and I get a job with a hat. Like, because, you know, they're old black parents. They are like, you graduated. I want to make sure you got a job with benefits. I want to make sure you got a 401k and retirement, uh, retirement plan. That's what most black parents that are older care about. They want to make sure you're set. And I was DJing. So back then, DJing wasn't a career. That wasn't a profession. That wasn't something that was going to, you know, make sure your family was held down. And at that time when nobody believed, Gia and her mom was like, nah, if this is what you want to do, let's do it. Like, whatever we got to do, I'm going to support you. You know, at the time, Gia was making more money than me. And she was like, this is your dream. Like, I want to support your dream. You, you want to buy Concord needles? They're $260 a needle, $300 a needle. Okay, let's buy them. You know, you want to buy turntables at the time? They were $500 for a Technique 1200, $569 for the 1210s. Okay, well, I'm going to help you buy it, you know? And this is what we were doing. And, you know, we were in back then, I couldn't afford a flight. Oh, you got a party in Virginia? We got to drive six hours to get a thousand dollars? Well, let's drive. You know what I mean? That's what we did. You know, a, a party in uh, uh, Syracuse for seven hundred dollars? It probably cost me two one hundred and fifty dollars in gas and one hundred and fifty in hotels, and I probably only made three hundred. But that three hundred was everything. But she was on my side. You know, when I was dropping off mixtapes, I didn't have security. She was there with the club. And I know a lot of people, like, the kids, don't know what a club is. A club is a, a device that they used to do to lock the steering wheel so they can't steal it. So she used to be there with the club, like making sure nobody tried to rob us or, or play us. So she was there holding me down. So to answer your question, hell no. When I left hot to go to power, she was the one that was like, nah, we're going to go to power. We're going to make this the best thing smacking. So she was that one. She was the one that had my back. I love it. On that note, let's bring, let's bring it in this, uh, on, babes. <laughs> this Casey family, Casey duo. So Hello. I, yeah. <laughs> I just um I just finished finished your book today. Um, real life, real love, amazing, amazing. And I'm curious what this process was like, Gia, putting this together, um, going through the ups, which I'm sure was easy in, in writing down, but going through the downs and reliving some of those moments. What was that like? Well, it was Sean's idea to write the book just like it was his idea to do the podcast. And the reason that I agreed is because we feel as though as a couple that have been through, as you put it, those high highs and those low lows in a sense of community to give it back, to teach people through all of our failures. You know, Michael Jackson said something not too, not Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan said something not too long ago that he learned to win by losing. And the same thing, applies to us. So a lot of people, you know, they note the content of the book and they say, you know, were you ashamed to share that? Did you have any trepidation? Did anything hold you back? And the writing of the book was very purpose driven. So no, there's no shame. There's no humiliation. There was no trepidation in any of that because we want to teach people how to win 
through our failures. We want to give people a tangible resource so that they can recognize maybe red flags in their relationship. So maybe they can identify a trajectory that their relationship might be on where they can say, hold on a minute, I've seen this before. And this is looking like my life. Let's sit down and have a conversation. There are people that don't know how to have that conversation. In the book, we teach people how to have a meaningful and effective conversation, which creates understanding, which is born out of respect so that you get to a place because we went through years of not having that. And I wish that I had a guide. I wish that I had a book that someone could give me or my mother could give me and say, you know what, food for thought, read this so that when you decide to become serious in a relationship, you can refer to these chapters and you can understand yourself better. And maybe you can understand your partner better and you can do better because now you know better. And that's what we wanted to give. It's kind of like um, a gift. And if we had to be the sacrificial lambs in the process, as long, and I know it sounds big, but I mean every word of it, as long as we're changing lives through those pages and making relationships better and encouraging people to take accountability and have better marriages and avoid bad relationship, then it's all worth it. Yeah, how how rewarding is that? You know, I, I I'm a I'm a newlywed. Um, got married last. Got married <laughs> last. And so um, and so we're learning. We're communicating. We're going through all those those early processes um, in terms of uh, married life or whatnot. And there's a lot of things that I may not have been taught or may not have seen firsthand. A lot of things I did see. A lot of things that I didn't see. Yes. First, we're learning on the fly, and so. I talk about representation a lot on this show and love obviously is universal, but with black love and that representation and being open and being a guide, how rewarding is it that people are reaching out and also appreciative of the help that you're giving them? Well, that was part of the reason when Rashawn said, you know, let's write a book that I agreed because based on our podcast, the feedback that we had gotten was so for me, like earth shattering, like it was to call it rewarding, couldn't even begin to suffice. All of the emails, all of the texts, as a matter of fact, tell me if you remember, we were in the Bahamas, we were staying at the Atlantis Hotel mm -hmm. and we were taking our kids on a ride. And this woman comes running up to me and her family's in tow, but she was ahead of them because she ran up to me. And without introducing herself, she gave me the biggest hug and tears literally started running down her face. And I'm like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I'm so sorry. I'm just overwhelmed to see you in person. I watch your podcast. And I just want to tell you that your podcast has saved our relationship. She said, I'm married today because of things that we learned from your podcast. We wouldn't be here on this family vacation happy if it wasn't for your podcast. And I just want, can we treat you to dinner? Can we take you out tonight? It was just, and I mean, I like, my eyes got watery and it was like the personification of emails and DMs and just other ways that people have found to reach out, of us, reach out to us. And there've been other times where people have stopped us on the street. So to understand that your words or your influence that's born out of your experiences that people respect is, changing the way that they look at life, they look at themselves, they look at each other. It's, it's very, very gratifying. No, um, I don't know if you guys remember this scene in, in Martin back in the day, he's having a fight with Gina and they're in the bedroom and he's, he's acting like he's done. You know, he's being the tough guy. He's like, you know what, Gina, step, step. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. You know, <laughs> makes his way to the door to leave. And he's like, no, Gina, don't leave, don't leave. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, one of the things that stood out to me um, from, from reading the book, and, and I think it helps us as, as men, Rashawn, is being in touch with our insecurities and being in touch with vulnerabilities. And that's something that, that um, you both outlined really well uh, in the book. Um, and sometimes we suppress that and things come about. Uh, we, we lash out in different ways, but it all stems from those insecurities and those vulnerabilities and things that we're struggling with uh, on the inside. Um, what have you learned about manhood, uh, not only through this process, but through your relationship with you? Um, I would think the, the most thing is, especially for myself is, life doesn't have an instruction manual, right? So a lot of this stuff I had to learn on my own. And I always say, you know, I realize, like I just said, 
I didn't have an instruction manual. My dad didn't have one either. So when it's things to learn, I'm trying to be different for my son. I'm trying to talk to him about some of the insecurities that I had and the problems that I had and, and the way that I was feeling. Um, and I realized that manhood is not, you know, because at, at, when you're a, a young individual, a young boy, or even a young man, you think protect and provide. That's what I got to do. I got to protect and I got to provide. But you also got to make sure that you're in a good space to be able to do that. And I wasn't in a good space. I was saying I was, provi I was protecting, but I really wasn't protecting. I was insecure and I was trying to make sure my wife wasn't trying to leave, which could have pushed her away, could have forced her out. But I had to realize that to be a man, I had to be a man with myself first and figure out who I am, make sure that I feel worthy, make sure I did the work on myself. And I didn't do that work on myself. You know, coming from, like I said, a kid that was five foot four, glasses, braces, acne, I always felt insecure. I felt like gear wasn't, I wasn't worthy for gear. So the fact that I, I got her, I always felt like somebody was going to be smarter. Somebody was going to look better. Somebody was going to be more dapper and treat her better. And because of that, I was like, if she doesn't leave, if I'm always with her, she'll never meet that person. And that almost made me lose the best thing that I've ever had in my life. So manhood is figuring out yourself, getting your own insecurities out the way so you don't push those insecurities on your spouse, on your lover. And, and for mine, it was my best friend. You know, losing, if I would have lost gear, it wasn't a matter of losing my, my lover. Yes, I would have lost my lover. Yes, I would have lost my wife, but I would have lost my best friend. That person that no matter what, you know is in your corner. You know, I'm sure you got friends and you got family members, but sometimes those family and those friends are not in your corner for the right reasons, right? You can't trust sometimes what they say because you don't know what they say is because they're looking out for your best interest or if they got a little hate in them. And not to say that's just life. That's just genuinely how people are. But I know when Gia says something, we're on the same team. I know we're doing something. She's not doing something out of spite. She's not doing something out of hate. She's not being envious. She wants me to win because when she wins, I win. When she loses, I lose. And that's what I almost lost. So those are the, the situations and conversations I like to have, especially with my son now, to make sure that he understands that early because he doesn't want to lose the best thing in his life when he ever finds that. No question. Um, there's, there's so many nuggets in the book. Again, real life, real love. So many nuggets. One that stuck out to me, Rashawn, was um, when you put... I had to find the courage to be the man I was pretending to be. Uh, could you explain on that? Yeah, I mean, and this, and this has to do a lot with social media. You know, when I was a kid, I didn't have to pretend nothing. I was in my own house. But now you're out and about and I'm pretending to be this grandioso man in all aspects of life. You know, I always say I was Rashawn in the house and I was DJ Envy in the street. And I didn't want to be DJ Envy in the street. I wanted to be Rashawn. I wanted to be cool and everything that I wanted to be as a person. But when I looked at the industry back then, the industry wanted you to be a certain way, right? That's what they told you what was cool. Single was cool back then. Having a bunch of girls at your table was cool back then. Being able to do what you wanna do and move how you wanted to move and not be a family man was cool back then. That was all pretending. What I wanted to be was a husband, a father, who I am now. I don't care what people say about me now. I don't care how people look at me now. It doesn't affect me because at the end of the day, I'm me. If somebody doesn't like who Rashawn is or who DJ Envy is, then honestly, it's like fuck you because I'm being myself. And if you don't like me as myself, then you can kiss my ass, honestly. I'm with it. I'm with it. The, 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 the love that you two have and, and your story in the book and what you went through at a, at a young age, and the strength that really just jumps out, you know, on the page. Um, what have you, what have you, not just within the relationship, but just living, what have you learned about yourself? And as you wrote the book and, and the eloquent things that you put and, and the beautiful words you have about your mom, just what have you learned about yourself in putting this book together also? Um, to be honest with you, I'm a very self-aware person and I'm a very deliberate person. I'm very intentional and, um, I think about things before they before I do them. I think about things before I say them. So this book was just a way of organizing my thoughts and <laughs> articulating my thoughts and putting it down on paper. For me, it was um, in a way to be a little bit more thoughtful about 
the collection of everything that I've experienced as it pertains to our relationship, parenting, my love for my parents, and um, what I want people to be able to take away from everything that I've lived through. Amazing story, uh, a fantastic read and a quick read. And, and it's, again, you guys continue to be a beacon of light with everything that you're doing with the podcast and then sharing your story in this book, saving relationships and uh, quite honestly, saving lives in the process as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate you both. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for, Thanks for having, having us, us man. Appreciate you. And congratulations again on the marriage. Tell yes. your wife we said hello. We'll do, absolutely, absolutely. She can hear you in the back. She's breathless. She, she, hello. Okay. Hi. <laughs> All right, have a good one. I appreciate you guys. Thank you.